What's up, guys? Welcome back to the Cole Cast, uh, Cole Podcast. I still can't remember what we ended up uh, calling it. I think it's the Cole Cast. Um, my name's Francis. If you remember me from last time, if you don't, that's fine too. Uh, today, we're going to continue on our series of uh, getting to know some of the people around the shop, uh, getting to know their backstory, getting to know what excites them, why they came out. Um, just overall, let you guys feel more connected to who we are. Um, and get some really cool stories out of it. So uh, today we've got Logan Gillahan. Hello. Uh, he is our is it lead engineer, head engineer, I, the only engineer, the engineer, both the top and the bottom of the totem right. pole. Yeah, there's there's a to- <laughs> it's just a guy standing is the totem it's just, pole. Just just me. Right. So uh, Logan is our head engineer. He uh, does a lot of things out here. I think my favorite thing about Logan. Uh, being out here is anytime we have uh, an outside visitor and I introduce him like, Hey, this is Logan. He's our engineer. Uh, the first thing they comment on is the fact that you're wearing steel toe boots and you're typically out on the floor. They're like, wait, you have an engineer that can run a drill. Um, <laughs> and it's like, yeah, yeah, that's pretty much where we're at. We, I've, I've done a very good job at making people believe that I know what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes you look competent. Yeah. Um, so, uh, before we get into any of the fun stuff about what inspires you, what sure. you're trying to accomplish, uh, just give us a backstory of where you came from, where you grew up, uh, and what kind of got you into a creative space or a maker space. Sure. Gosh. Well, okay. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I was born at a very young age, sure. uh, grew up in the Pacific Northwest, uh, just outside of Portland, Oregon. Um, yeah, just kind of a standard run of the mill childhood, loved playing outside in the summers and played with lots of Legos and all that kind of stuff. Uh, my dad is, uh, uh an IT guy, um, computer science kind of guy has a, a kind of a corporate background as well, but he would always have, um, kind of DIY projects at home that yeah. he would work on. He wasn't ever, he never dove into like a specific hobby. You know, some guys will build like model airplanes or, or, you know, boats or whatever. Well, actually he did build a boat, but that was kind of a one-off project. Yeah. yeah. Um, so he, he would refer to himself as a craftsman, not in the sense of like, you know, someone who's really honed in on their craft, but like someone who's like, I'm content to go buy the craftsman brand tool. Sure. <laughs> like, to get whatever I'm doing. Yeah. Like he doesn't done. need top of the line done or whatever. He yeah. like, he shops at home Depot and you know, so like for an example, uh, he, uh, I remember a project he did was he built a conference room table for his office that they had just moved. His company had just moved into a new building and it, he got some quote for a conference table that was like astronomical. He's like, Psh, I can do that. Yeah. And laminated some plywood and did some like top sheeting and stuff for it. And I remember that project like super vividly, but that was kind of like his background. And so growing up watching that, you know, I was introduced to using tools and doing stuff yourself, DIY, um, very casually, but like very consistently from a, from a pretty early early age. And so actually from that specific project, the, uh, the conference room table, it was shaped kind of like an ellipse. And so he had these off cuts with this like gentle arc that had like this, like the corners that you would cut off of a oh, sheet. Sure. Sure. And I remember I took those pieces and cut them off like with his help. Obviously I think I was like six or seven years old. Unsupervised. At the time. Yes. Just running all of the just power, running tools. all the power. Tools. Um, and, uh, I built a robot out of wood that was six feet tall, which was, I, I was not that tall. Right. You might've been that tall at the age of seven, but I <laughs> was not. So, uh, uh, yeah, I remember taking that, like hit the offcuts of his project and, and kind of being inspired by him doing it, but like, you know, playing with it and being creative, like right. a seven year old would. There's be. no accountability at that age. If you ruin the scraps, your dad's not going to be no, yeah. down your throat. No, they're yeah. scraps. I, you know, he, he gave them to me to, right. to mess with. So it was kind of like, that's kind of a, an example I always used to describe. Like I, I bounced around all kinds of hobbies and stuff growing up, but like I've always had a knack for being mechanically minded and working with my hands. And I knew from a very young age that I wanted to pursue being, you know, at the time I, I want to be an inventor. You know, I didn't know what an engineer was, right? but as I grew up and was able to hone in on kind of that, that part of me, I knew for sure that I wanted to go into like engineering and making stuff and working with my hands and that kind of stuff. Yeah. So that's kind of the background. But other than that, you know, I mean, I love the Pacific Northwest growing up there was epic and you know, Indiana is not that, but it's also not, you know, it has its own, its own merits. So. Yeah. It's, it's pros and cons. I think, you know, of everybody in the shop, we've probably 
you and I lived in the most places. Yes, so we don't absolutely. have a lot of people. Noah mm-hmm. or not Noah? Uh, Nathan came from Ohio to Indiana, right? Which, which is, is just more of the same. Pretty similar. Yeah. Um, he lived in Indianapolis mm-hmm. as his big city experience. Right. I think I've lived in the St. Louis area, Chicago area, Indianapolis area, mm-hmm. and and even you know geographically, it's all the same. Sure. But there's a little bit more variety there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so you have a little bit more of the experience with, uh, you know. Nobody in Indiana built their own boat. I don't know if you've... That's fair. <laughs> you've That's come fair. to recognize this. Uh, yeah. We don't have a lot of water, and the water we do have... Uh, is not enough to sustain a boat. So, sure. Uh, yeah. That's a that's a pretty cool. Uh, uh, I I want to say forte, but it's obviously not a forte if he only did it once. Sure. Um, that's a that's a neat adventure that he went on in yeah. building a boat. Yeah. Um. Can you can you remember th- the time that it kind of clicked where you said you don't you didn't know what an engineer was, but mm-hmm. you wanted to be an inventor? Can you kind of remember the time where it clicked where you were like? Oh, this is viable because growing sure. up, my dad was a chemist and I would just sure. tell people I'm going to be a chemist. Okay. I didn't know what that meant. Sure. I just thought I had to know chemistry. Right. What, what was the time that it clicked where you were like, oh, this is viable. And this thing I've wanted to do since I was six years old and build a right. robot. Right. It'll work. Sure. Yeah. That's, I don't remember specifically when I understood of like mechanical engineering is a major you can go sign up for in college. Mm-hmm. But I, it's as funny as it sounds, it's kind of tacky. Uh, the first Iron Man movie. Okay. Tony Stark. I saw that movie and I was like, that's it. Is that the, the scene where he like, he has like the, the, the forge set up and well, just that era of like the, of his character development of like where he first builds the suit or whatever is like just who he is in that movie is like dude that sees a problem has all of the stuff at his disposal and the skill set and make something awesome to right. solve that problem. And like, you know, th- being a billionaire would be fun too, yeah, but I'm not quite nice. there yet. Yeah, yeah, sounds um, great. But that kind of aspect of like, yeah, I want to be Tony Stark when I grow up. Okay. I want to be a wildly successful person who makes really cool stuff. So what's know? the closest you've felt to Tony Stark since taking over this adventure into engineering? What's the closest thing oh, that you've gosh. felt? Honestly, this sounds like super salesman y, the digital press controller. Yeah. I, I, the fact that we have a touch screen on what is functionally a log splitter, mm-hmm. like a really, really well built, best, like specific log splitter. Yeah. Uh, the fact that it, there's a touch screen on there is still kind of blows my mind. Yeah. And I, I'm saying that like entirely removed from like the fact that I was the one that like, did that right but yeah no it's yeah it's uh it's pretty sweet okay so <laughs> with the dpcc being being said um you know i don't know if everybody knows or you know it'd be wild if everybody responded and was like yeah we knew sure uh, the dpc is what brought you here yes um, absolutely so go ahead and, and give us your side of the story of how you linked up with us sure. and, and what was going on and the specific kind of turn of events that went from I'm selling you uh, my services to mm-hmm. I'm selling everything I own and I'm <laughs> yeah. going to come work. <laughs> right. Okay. So uh, yeah, I graduated college in uh, 2019. Mm-hmm. And so I uh, had a like job lined up coming out of school. Everything was like pretty fast tracked and that all got pulled out from under me like right as I graduated or the week after I graduated, I literally like went to my job the first day and there was some issues with their non-competes and their conflict of interest stuff. And they were like, Hey, we're not going to hire you after all. So oh, it's like, okay. Oh, sick. So I spent that summer, uh, just making knives. So I, I had been Very a knife maker. <laughs> <laughs> I had been a knife maker, uh, since 2015. So I started right as I was going to college. Um, but, uh, for context of what I'm talking about. So I, I, went back to knife making and I'm, I mean, I'm kind of bouncing around here, but, um, got connected through a, uh, friend from school, um, and my senior capstone project that I did when I was at Oregon state was with Nike. Okay. And I actually threw a connection at Nike, got connected with a guy who does a lot of work for them. Who was an automation engineer. And he had a super small firm uh, outside of Portland. Like I was the fourth person to join the team. Okay. So very small, small, small. very small. Uh, and they specialized in 
sub one million dollar projects for Google and Amazon and Nike okay. of really high end either custom machinery building. So we would do like assembly cells for the Nike, um, you know, like a Nike air shoe, mm-hmm. like that whole series of shoes. The Air Max. Yeah. Air Max. Yeah. I mean, and, and that whole, um, category of their products, uh, all of the air <laughs> is made either in St. Louis or in Beaverton, Oregon. Yeah. And they actually will make them there and ship them to China to be built into shoes okay. and then ship the shoes back. Like the, the pockets. The actual air pockets. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So that process is like very closely guarded secrets. The, the gases they fill the air pockets with, what the air pockets are made out of, like all of that is all very like... Like you talking Secrets about this stuff. is putting our lives in danger. Probably. Okay. Yeah, Good. exactly. Good to know. No. Uh, so that was my, my senior capstone project was working for what's called RMI at Nike, which was uh, that division. But anyway, so uh, this guy does a lot of work for them and, and really specializes in like robotics and machine vision and that kind of stuff. And he, I got connected with him right as the pandemic started like started. Yeah. So I'm like probably the only person I know that actually found a job Be- during the yeah, pandemic yeah. versus like most people had the exact opposite experience. Uh, but yeah, so I, uh, got connected with him, met up and you know, he looked at my knife making background and what I was interested in in engineering and that kind of stuff and thought I would be a good fit. So he brought me on to, uh, be kind of a, I mean, a mechanical guy. He needed, he was handling the software and the machine vision, that kind of stuff. He needed someone to like put fasteners in SolidWorks assemblies okay. and, and flesh out like the CAD models of like the actual like frames of the machines and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, so yeah, I joined that team and, uh, that was kind of my first like real job as an engineer. And I worked there for about a year and halfway through that year after about six months of working there, um, we had, we were just pretty slow. I mean, during the pandemic and yeah. basically my boss gave me free license to, come up with my own projects if I wanted to, especially if I could find someone to do them for or with, yeah, yeah. then like, you know, do whatever you want. Yeah. If so, somebody will buy what you're dreaming about, I highly encourage that you well, dream. Well, then yeah. yeah like, yeah. you know, I, I basically like if I had had a project to do for myself, I would have had the freedom to do so. But like what ended up happening was finding someone to partner with on the project, turned it into something huge it yeah. turned out eventually to be huge um but to kind of circle back i actually had uh I, I gained an interest in forging and and blacksmithing and that kind of stuff maybe like halfway through college is kind of when i i understood like i had understood what damascus steel was and and i had used it before i hadn't made it myself but oregon state actually had a blacksmithing club on campus mm-hmm. so i mean it was a pretty crappy forge an anvil out of an old chemistry lab like it was pretty scrapped together they were in the process of converting a log splitter to be used as a press but no one had any idea what they were doing right um and so i had like had been introduced to, to blacksmithing and that kind of stuff and i actually have i'm i hate that I don't have this anymore. I actually remember crumpling up the sketch and throwing it away, but I had a rough sketch of a forging press with how I would want it to work just from like a customer requirement perspective. No, no problem solving. Just like, what would I want it to do? And the like auto mode and the spring return mode and that kind of stuff. Cause like you'll see guys have like mechanical springs on their presses yeah. that they have to like throw a lever to engage or disengage them. And I always yeah. thought that that was clunky, but I just had this like list of like how I behaviors that would be like really cool to have. And like the kiss block thing with the, that we now have on the controller sure. was there in that concept, but I had no idea how I would ever do it. Like the word solenoid scared me. I, cause I didn't even know what it was at the time. Yeah. Um, but I have this sketch of, you know, what I would want it to do. And I remember going to a scrap yard and buying some I beams that I was going to like start to weld together to do a, uh, my own press build and that kind of stuff. Cause I wanted to get into making Damascus. Mm. And I remember crumpling up and throwing away the sketch because as I learned more about how the hydraulics work and all that kind of stuff, I was like, this stuff is impossible. Like you don't need, you don't need that. And it's not like, yeah, you like someone could do it, but it's like, it wouldn't be worth it. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I threw it away and then I was driving home from work at that day that my boss at the automation firm was like, Hey, well, like if you have any ideas for projects, like, you know, throwing away, like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, uh, I was driving home and it was just like, Oh man, 
I, I could put one of these, I had been learning this, the system that we now use for our controller for a, a different project at work. And I was like, Oh, I could take that system and I could, I could put it on a forging press. Mm -hmm. And that, that would make that, that sketch that I had from years ago, actually like a reality. Yeah. And, uh, that was just kind of a lightning, like, or an aha moment, you know, light bulb It's like, Oh, I could totally do that. And so I pitched it to my boss. He was like, yeah, man, that, that sounds cool. Like find someone to sell it to. It's like, okay. And I had known about Cole through Instagram mm -hmm. and that's how I got in touch with them is I sent a DM to Cole iron on Instagram and Dave Delagardel, who runs our Instagram saw my message and I basically hit him up and said, Hey, uh, I have an idea that could be super cool. And well, we should definitely talk about it, but like, I don't want to just like message it to you here on DM. Like, can we jump on a phone call? Right. And Dave was like, uh, Hey, that does sound super cool, but this is way above my pay grade. So, uh, I'll, what's your phone number? I'll give it to Nathan. And so, uh, I got on a phone call with Nathan and just basically pitched the idea of what would eventually become the digital press controller. And, uh, yeah, his response was, that's awesome. We've been trying to do that with two other companies and they've failed miserably. Yeah. So if you can, do it, send it and let's see what, what can happen. Yeah. So six months or eight months of development later, we're standing at blade show of 21, 21. Yeah. Blade show 21. Cause 2020 was canceled. Um, blade show 21 launching the digital press controller. And I had actually a week prior to the blade show quit my job because the, basically the firm had gone under during yeah. the pandemic and I, it wasn't a sustainable job for me anymore. And so, uh, the only thing I had been working on for those six months was the controller. So I, uh, parted ways with the firm really amicably. The guy really took care of me and basically, you know, gave my, gave his blessing to take the DPC project wherever it needed to go. Yeah. And so I'm sitting at blade show meeting the coal iron guys, who at the time was uh, Nate and Philip and David meeting them in person for the first time mm -hmm. and talking to, to Nathan and uh, Nate was like, so what's your plan? you like, you, you quit last week, didn't you? <laughs> I was like, yeah, man, I'm not at, not at KTM anymore. He's like, so what are you going to do? And I was like, I don't know. Why don't you hire me? And he just like laughed, laughed it off. It's like, oh yeah, we could talk about it. Unbeknownst to me, he was already planning on talking to me about that at the same show yeah. that, that he was on the same page. And so, uh, we obviously got to know each other over the course of that weekend. And a couple weeks after that flew me out to Indiana to check the place out, kind of do an extended interview slash training session about the DPC yeah. for the guys here. And, uh, yeah, like two or three months after that, I packed up the truck and moved my entire life to Anderson, Indiana. Yeah. To, uh, to come work here full time. So it was just uh, the right call. I was at a point where, you know, I didn't have the job anymore. You know, the, all of the pandemic stuff made, um, the West coast getting away from the West coast had some benefits. I'll just put it that way. Yeah. I dove into it. I, I <laughs> moved from, from Indiana to Chicago doing mm. that. And it, you know, with completely non-political the differences in re in in day-to-day -day life sure. between yeah. living in indiana and living in totally. chicago were yeah night and day and yeah. and the the people were just as nice in, in one city as, as in the other right but the expectations were so much different that like i ended up for the first few months i was in chicago it's like you know in in indiana you would go get gas you don't have a mask on you right know? in chicago it's like you had a mask on they had hand sanitizer pumps there they had gloves for you to use and it was just like one big difference is obviously the, the population density. Yeah, of and, course. You know, stuff. So, yeah. But yeah, you did the opposite where yeah. like you, you were like, okay, I'm. I went from, from this complete lockdown to. Is there even a pandemic going on out here? Yeah. Not to mitigate the risks or anything no, like that or the severity of it, but a lot of people were acting like it wasn't even a thing. Yeah. And, yeah. and it, and it, it wasn't spreading as, as quickly because you're not around sure. 500, 600 people a day. You're yeah, that's six. fair. So, yeah, right. You know, right. Um, realistically, we are in a smaller place where, where, you know, those things were a little bit less strenuous. Sure. Um, so I just, I think it's funny that we kind of flip-flop places there. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, no, it was kind of wild. I had never been to Indiana before. Yeah. You know, no one I knew had, had been to Indiana. It was kind of one of those, where is that on the map Does again? it exist? Yeah. Right. So, you know, for a while, my dad kept telling people I was moving to Illinois. 
because mm-hmm. he just just getting everything mixed up. And it's like, I mean, it is to someone who's never spent any time in the Midwest. It's an sure. understandable mistake, but like, it's kind of hilarious. Well, it's like people in Indiana. If you were to say that you're from Oregon, do they know where's that, that again? Oregon's on top? Or yeah. is Washington on top. Right. Yeah. You know? Like which exactly. one is which? Exactly. So, so I understand people missing up Illinois and Indiana. Totally. We don't have like a cool shit. We're not like Michigan shaped like a glove, you know? Yeah. Literally a rectangle yeah. with like some stuff at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's, there's, uh, <laughs> there's kind of recognizable things in, in geography and right. Illinois and Indiana don't have that. No, they don't. All. But yeah, so it, it, it turned into the opportunity to move out here really was a, to further the DPC. There was some stuff about it that I'm sure Cole would have been able to figure it out if I had decided not to move out here. Sure. I'm sure it would have been fine, but me being out here to oversee the direct launch and implementation and stuff like that was the right call. Yeah. Um, as well as, you know, I've been able to dive in and just further what we're doing for developmentally here at Cole. Mm-hmm. So it, it's been, it's turned into an absolute dream job for me. You know, I have, really fallen in love with forging in Damascus. And I, I have some really dear friends that, and mentors that I've developed relationships with centering around the art of blacksmithing and steel making and that kind of stuff. And so, you know, I don't know if freshman engineer Logan would have said like, yeah, I want to move to Indiana and, and work for a forging company. But yeah. now that I'm here, it's like, yeah, this is exactly so where your I Your freshman year was 2015? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's when the year we started. Right. Yeah. And we were, you know, yep. uh, I don't think that freshman Logan would have come to Cole <laughs> in freshman year. You know, no, I don't, yeah, we didn't no. have anything to offer. No. Yeah. So we both had to gain our skills. We yeah, absolutely. That and that's something that Nathan has mentioned to me as well as in his kind of entrepreneurial, I mean, journey with this company was like, you know, 2021 was him hiring his first quote unquote real engineer, Mm -hmm. which is like, it's weird for me feeling like I am, you know, pretty green in the engineering world. Uh, you know, I had a year of corporate experience under my belt before coming to Cole. Um, but you know, when it works, it works when it's the right call, it's the right call. So it's been, it's been wild. I've been here for almost two years, um, at this point. So September of 21 or well, September of this year will be two years okay. that I've been in Indiana, but I, you know, was working for the company starting in that June of that year. But yeah, that's kind of the long drawn out version of yeah. Logan's move to Indiana. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, you you kind of gave the story a little bit, at least the timeline, um, you know, that's what brought you to Cole. Yeah. But what brought you into making? You know, you sure. have this kind of experience yeah, as a kid. Connecting those dots. Connect those dots and tell me where you said knives. Because you have this specialty in, in in pocket knives, you know, tactical. Yeah, sure. I don't know what you want to call it with David. We can, yeah. we always know what he loves to call it. It's mythopoetic. Yeah, yeah right. With David. Which I'm pretty Nathan, sure he coined that term. Oh, he had to have. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's, you know, Brute de Forge or Forge de Brute. Right. Depending on the day, he calls it either, right? Yeah. So everybody kind of has these sure. terms. I don't know what you like to call your stuff. Yeah, I think... I mean, I just, I'm a knife maker and I I don't really have like a specific like category that I try to put myself into. Mm -hmm. Most people would refer to my stuff as like modern tactical, like stock removal style knives. So, um, yes, a lot of EDC stuff. Yeah. A lot of everyday carry, a lot of like outdoor hunting, hiking, you know, that kind of stuff. They're just utility knives. That's kind of the whole thing is it's box cutters. Yeah. I I mean, (laughs) honestly though, like if we're being honest, the number one thing any of the knives that I've made get used for is opening Amazon right. boxes, which then I'm totally okay. We with here at the shop never have knives on us. Yeah. There's, I, there's, there's a very small amount of people that do. Yeah. It's like, yeah. I'm always like, Oh, where's my, I, I broke, I broke my, my knife that I carry and the microphone yeah, and like breaking knives, mics. Um, but I broke my knife like two years ago or something like that. Sure. And I just haven't, replaced you just haven't replaced it. I work with a ton of talented, bladesmiths i have a lot of friends that don't work here that make wonderful are you are, wonderful you, are you dropping hints that you need a new knife no i actually have uh i'm i'm trading a couple hammers for there you go. for a knife because what i was asked specifically hey what do you carry and i was like right. nothing. literally nothing. <laughs> nothing it's in half so, in a drawer at home yeah so um 
Well, yeah. What uh, What was the point where maybe you got into forging and you were like, man, I really don't like ornamental stuff. Or sure. Uh, I, what What got you into forging and what What got you into knives specifically? Yeah. So what's kind of funny is the knife thing was never about the knives. Like growing up, I wasn't a knife guy. My f- best friend gave me my first pocket knife when I was like a sophomore in high school. Like it, I was ne- like, I've always appreciated a knife that like, it's very useful to have on hand. Like, you know, there, I don't question why someone would carry one, but I was never like, Oh man, like knives are freaking awesome. You know what I mean? I didn't have that like passion about the knife specifically, but I've always been really into like outdoor firearm stuff. And with that industry, I mean, there's a reason why when you go to a show and it's called a gun and knife show, right? Uh, that, that stuff's really tied into to stuff, uh, really closely. It's really tight knit. And so just through like social media, as it grows, you know, I, you start to follow people that I remember, uh, early or maybe like my sophomore year of high school, junior year of high school. Uh, one of my buddies showed me a post from, it, it was from some company of, I don't know, like say it was like Benchmade knives or whatever. Uh, he showed me a post on Instagram and I was like, do you, you follow a company on Instagram? Yeah. Why? Like that's unheard of. It's not your friends. Yeah. Like you, you follow your friends on Instagram. Like it's, it's social media, you know, like you're supposed to connect with people and why are you following a company? It's like, Oh dude, I don't know. It's just like, I like their stuff. And then, you know, nowadays it's like, well, yeah, duh. Like yeah. social media is how people advertise to us. Yeah. That's it's, why you it's use marketing it. Media. <laughs> right. it's not social media. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. I like, I never see posts from my f- actual friends from back home, like at all anymore. No. No. Um, which is kind of wild to think about, but uh, so that was kind of the start of like, Oh, I'm going to follow like these companies that I like. And then you get connected to like, Hey, there's like a dude making super cool knives. That's like, he like will hold up a f- piece of phone book paper and like let the knife just like fall and it'll just like slice through the piece of phone book paper. And to me as a layman at the time was like, wow, that's crazy. You know, shaving hair sharp, that kind of stuff. Uh, and so you, you start to see that kind of stuff on Instagram. You follow a couple more people. And I, I kind of got introduced to the concept of like a custom knife maker mm-hmm. through Instagram. And I remember having a pocket knife, just like a, you know, plastic case, uh, Gerber knife, whatever, like from REI, yeah. like super bare bones, cheap pocket knife. And it was just dull as all get. It was a butter knife functionally. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I messaged one of these guys on Instagram who did the like following through the paper sharp nest tests and that kind of stuff and said, Hey, like, do you, do you sharpen knives like as a service or do I have to buy one of yours? Like, can I send you a pocket knife and will you sharpen it for me? And, uh, this guy's name was, uh, Frankie Hemming, uh, tactical pterodactyl knives is his handle okay. on Instagram. So I think you've showed me him. Before. Yeah. So, uh, awesome guy. Uh, he's out of South Carolina and, uh, I sent that message at the time he had like 50,000 followers, I think on Instagram, which was like a lot at the That's time. Still a lot. Yeah, it still is. And, uh, I, so I shot that message to him like as a total like shot in the dark, like, Oh, it'd be cool to have like this guy sharpen this for me. Yeah. But like, I was not expecting to get a response, especially from someone with the following that big. And, uh, not only did he respond, but his response was, yeah, man, I'd be happy to do that for you. Or I'll just tell you how to do it and you can do it yourself. So you don't have to send it out to be sharpened anymore. So not only I was expecting to like not get a response at all, yeah. but the response that I did get was like no secrets. Yeah. It was all just generosity with the information. Right. And so we, we connected via email and he sent over like, if you go buy the Harbor freight one by 30 grinder and all that kind of stuff, um, you know, this is what you need and here's how I do it and like, go give it a shot for yourself. Yeah. And so I was mulling that over for a couple of weeks and trying to th- think about what to do. But, um, I figured, you know, like, Oh, I'll go spend a hundred bucks on supplies and a, a little sander to mm-hmm. do this. And then that way, like, I'll just always be able to have a sharp knife. Like that's a good skill to have as a well-rounded person. Like right. why not Yeah, do your it, taxes sharpen? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. Checks a box as someone mm-hmm. with a background of hunting, fishing, shooting, you know, outdoor stuff, always l- appreciating being a maker and that kind of stuff. It seemed like a no brainer of right. like, yeah, I might as well give it a shot. Yeah. You know, it seems like it's pretty cheap money for the skill set that it would give you. Yeah. So I went to Harbor freight and used the super coupon and got the little green one by 30 that everyone starts with for like $38 or whatever it is. And, uh, got some belts from online and sharpened 
my first knife. I ground half of it away in the process, but by the time I was done, it would shave hair. Yeah. And that was through some back and forth with Frankie. But again, he totally mentored me through the process of getting started, getting my feet wet, yeah. you know, and it turns out once you buy all that stuff that you need to sharpen stuff the way that he does, uh, actually making the knife from start to finish is a piece of steel, a way to cut it out and a way to heat treat it. Right. Like that's it. And so I started, you know, diving into the university of YouTube and, uh, just doing research. I've always been super like topically research oriented. And so yeah. like once I am interested in something, I'll spend days online just consuming as much content about it as I can just to understand it further. And so that's what I did. You know, I, there's a, a handful of, of YouTube videos that are, have gone viral because of so many different knife makers. That's their like fundamental starting point of like, Oh yeah, this video helped me get started and yeah. that kind of stuff. So rolling through all that stuff, uh, I decided to go in and buy a piece of steel and give it a shot. But again, it wasn't, it wasn't about making the knife. It was just making. Yeah the knife was just the application of it. And the other side of it was, I'm not ashamed to admit that there was an entrepreneurial like business aspect to it as well of like, mm. Oh, there are dudes making knives in their garage and they're making five knives a week mm -hmm. and selling them for $400 a piece. Yeah. Like that dude's making an extra 1200 bucks a week or 1500 bucks a week. I wasn't going to correct any of your, or yeah, I'm ballparking, <laughs> obviously <laughs> yeah. like, you know, even if it's a, a month, like an extra 1200 bucks a month add to a college student at the time was like, yeah. dang, that's actually pretty good money. Spoiler alert. It's not that great of money when you do it full time. Yeah. <laughs> at least, you know, from a handmade perspective, yeah. but, uh, there's a lot of investments to sink into. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Indeed. But you know, I saw it as, as an opportunity there as well. Of like, oh, if I could actually like do this, mm -hmm. And that could be really awesome. And, you know, fast forward to what I already mentioned of when the rug got pulled out from under me at, uh, that job, mm -hmm. I spent that summer and in, into that following year, just making knives full time. And I was able to support myself through that mm -hmm. in a brief interim time. It wasn't what I wanted to do at the time, but you know, I had it. So it was, yeah. it was, a, it was an awesome resource to have. But anyway, so that was a uh, summer of 2015. So it was right before I went down to college for my freshman year. Sure. Like two weeks before I moved to my college town was like when I finished my first knife. Okay. Um, and it's funny, actually, uh, my dad always tells the story of when I did that first knife. Cause I cut out, it was a, what I thought at the time was a very like small to medium size, good working knife. It was about 12 and a half inches long and, uh, had a six and a half inch blade on it. And so, you know, I ordered a big bar of steel and I cut the whole thing out with a hacksaw and it took like six hours. And my dad was out in the garage when I started and he didn't tell me, but to himself was like, yeah, he's not going to make it 20 minutes. Like this hobby is going to be over before it even begins. Yeah. And six hours later, I walk into the house and hand him a like rough cutout blank. And that was when he knew that like, oh, there's, there's something, something here. going on yeah. here. That's not just like a random project, yeah. a random DIY project, you know? So yeah, I went down to school and was really, uh, blessed to get into a house like one street off of campus. That was a, a rental that I, I lived with my brother and, and a couple other roommates and really awesome house that had an unfinished basement and a shed in the driveway. And through the grace of God, I talked my roommates into letting me take over the basement and the shed in the driveway to be a couple of workbenches and then a grinding room okay. in the driveway. So I, you know, at the time had three tools, but over the course of a college career ended up with two, you know, U hauls full yeah. of tooling that had to be moved out of that house. Um, but yeah, I've started, you know, when I was in college, which is kind of like the prime time to do something like this because your schedule is so sporadic yeah. and you have so much like, Oh, I've got three hours before I have to go to my next class. Yeah. I'm just going to bike home, grab some lunch, and then I'll like hand sand a knife for a little bit and then yeah. go back to school. You As know? somebody who used to have to schedule college kids in multiple jobs, sure. I've worked fast food, I've worked retail. 
the biggest struggle that I had was scheduling them because totally. it was like they have a 9 a.m. class that lasts till 11. Then they have to yep. go back at 5. And it's like, I don't have a shift that's noon to 4. Right. You can't work yeah. here. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. That's not realistic. Yeah. And, and then they're like, well, I can't go home. You know, they live in Indianapolis, but they, they right. go to school in Anderson. It's like, well, sure. I can't go home for two hours. So what do they do? Yeah. You know, they pick up weird hobbies. Sure. Like making knives. Like making knives. Yeah, yeah super weird hobby for sure. <laughs> no, so yeah, that was... uh that was kind of what led into it. So I, you know, started learning at a alarming rate, mm-hmm. just consuming as much knowledge as I could on making knives and learned about Damascus steel and, and, uh, got involved with the blacksmithing club at Oregon state. And, um, yeah. So that kind of lit, led into, um, as I explored that kind of stuff, um, and the people I was following, I, was introduced to, um, Steve Schwarzer mm. down in Crescent city, Florida, sure. uh, also known as the wizard. Yes. Um, master I, Roshi. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, uh, I got a, an opportunity to, I found out who Steve was through an Alex Steele video, uh, that actually will Stelter had gone down and filmed with him. And I through that video is who, how I learned who Steve was. Yeah. And then, uh, at blade show, 2018 in Portland, Blade Show West, West. was in okay. Portland. Yeah. So it's like, it's my backyard, right? And uh, Steve was there and I had a chance to introduce myself and I was like, oh, I wanna, I wanna go learn how to make Damascus from Steve. And so I introduced myself and got his card and was able to uh, put a class on the schedule to fly down there and, and go learn from him. So that was kind of the other aspect of things was I'd always been interested in forging because of the Damascus and that kind of stuff. But going to see Steve and this was like, I, so I, I went and saw Steve for the first time in January of 2020. Okay. So that was like right, right the, before, right before the pandemic yeah. hit, like a week and a half. I flew back from Steve's a week and a half before like the first confirmed case okay. was in the United States. Um, but uh, yeah, that was kind of the, uh, the catalyst towards my interest in forging specifically was going and learning from Steve and, kind of diving down the rabbit hole of, of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but that's kind of where, you know, cause most of the knife making stuff that I do is, is all stock removal. So instead of heating up a piece of steel and beating it into shape mm-hmm. on an anvil, I would just take a bar of steel and take away everything. That's not a knife. Yeah. So that was kind of where going down to Steve's was kind of what shifted my focus towards. I still do plenty of stock removal stuff, but shifted my focus towards like wanting to join the American bladesmithing society and pursue what eventually hopefully will be a master Smith rating with them and, you know, going down that whole side of the journey. But that's kind of the, like between growing up as like a maker kid, kind of more like a Lego kid, to be yeah. honest <laughs> to, you know, college was that like basically me growing the Northwest blade work stuff. And then after college, was the broken road that led me to Indiana. <laughs> so <laughs> God bless the broken road. Uh, so, you know, you kind of called yourself out and it's a joke that a lot of people make is they're like, Oh, you're not a knife maker. You're a stalker. Maker. Oh, trash. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just the worst thing to find a way that you can make something beautiful and it's not the same way I would do it. Right. Like that's the, right, right. It's like, dude, it's still a knife. It's still probably better than anything I will ever sure, make. Sure. I don't care if you made it on a grinder, if you made it, you know, handmade it and never touched it right on any, you know, belt grinder or anything and everything's done by hand. I don't care. It's still wonderful. Yeah, totally. Um, I totally would have made fun of you had you not already called yourself out. So that was that's a good fair. Goal. Yeah. You know, what's funny is that first time that I met Steve in person at Blade Show West, mm-hmm. I introduced himself at, or I introduced myself as a stock removal knife maker. And his response was, Oh, well that's, a f- that's okay. That means you just, you know how to actually finish knives. Yeah. Cause there was a ton of bladesmiths that can forge fine, mm-hmm. but they can't finish anything well. Right. So, yeah, I, I, I think that's, it's potato, potato, right? It's like, yeah, wh- it's, whatever you do, it's two different sides of the same mode. coin. Yeah, yeah. Because, uh, someone who forges uh, specifically talking about knives, mm-hmm. someone who forges a blade still does everything a stock removal guy will do, except maybe a little bit of less time at a bandsaw. Yeah. You're still grinding. You're still hand sanding. You're still fitting yeah, all the that finishing, kind of the stuff. Yeah. All yeah. It's of all the same. Still there. Yeah. Right. So, so nowadays that you're, you know, you, you found this love for, for knife making and you, uh, have gotten into Damascus. Mm -hmm. Um, I've 
probably had more experiences and more conversations about Damascus with you in the past eight months than I've had <laughs> ever before in my life. Sure. Um, what is like, what is it about Damascus? What about that process is cause it, it definitely intrigues you. It definitely sure. sparks your interest. Mm -hmm. And I think we had a slight conversation a few days ago about what you like about Damascus sure. being like the almost being production level, but still not replicatable. Yeah, totally. What is it about Damascus that like gets you so worked up yeah. <laughs> for lack of better terms? You know, what's funny is it, the answer to that is kind of the same answer about the knives where it's not that I have a specific obsession with patterns mm -hmm. or that I, you know, have the mind to, to kind of push the envelope in that sense. And it's not, you know, necessarily coming from a forging background because I got into forging because of the Damascus, not the other way around. Right. But it was a little bit of a mix of like, hey, when I make a knife out of Damascus steel, I can sell it for twice what I normally would sell it for. Right. Also, Damascus is really cool. Also, forging is really fun. And especially when you're making Damascus and the goal has everything to do with like the cross section or the end grain of your end result. And like, if you accidentally like squish something too far, one direction, it doesn't just like immediately scrap the part, Yeah, <laughs> you know? So it's very easy forging to do at least when it comes to actually squishing the material. Right. Um, but a lot of it is a, I've always been a tool guy. I've always appreciated machines and tools and you know all of that stuff but also um like the tooling related to forging you know power hammers and that kind of stuff going down to florida and visiting steve and running his 200 pound chambersburg is mm. like that's it that's y yeah that's, that's nirvana th that's the dream yeah that's, <laughs> that's nirvana we've ach we've achieved enlightenment and it is in a swamp in florida yes facts you know making whatever you want as long as it's loud and it's fast. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, th I think that there's something primal in hot working steel. Oh, absolutely. Like yeah. it, just the fact that like, once you hit a certain temperature, it glows on its own. It's generating its own light. There's so much energy in the material that it just has to get rid of that energy via light. Yeah. Like that, that to me, and that's like the very engineering way to describe it or like physicist way of describing right. it. But it's still true. Like there's the number of like things that are so different from like modern, typical run of the mill day to day life when it comes to forging material is mm -hmm. it, it, it just kind of like, there's definitely a, like, like I said, like a primal appreciation for yeah. that process. And so that's kind of where the Damascus stuff for me came into is like, it's a lot easier at the time. It was a lot easier to make than it was to buy Damascus. I can make it how I want it to be done. I don't have to, you know, put someone else's name on the knife. Right. Uh, the, in the knife industry, that's referred to as sole authorship, where you're making the material to make the knives to then, you know, you're making everything from its most fundamental yeah. components short of like going and mining the ore out of the earth sure, yeah. and, you know, yeah. refining it into steel. Although some guys will do that too. Yeah. yeah. But that, that is kind of, as I like developed into where I am now as a knife maker and in the interest in Damascus and making folding knives and that kind of stuff, the idea of like doing a sole authorship folder mm -hmm. out of stainless steel and titanium Damascus that I've made myself. That's like, that's the peak of the mountain that I'm climbing. Okay. That's kind of where that, that all came together. So, so what, what happens when you make that folder? I don't know. Okay. I have some material that I could make one of those out of which is wild to me, but I'll find a new mountain. Yeah. I, I have a couple other mountains that I'm climbing both personally off the clock and on the clock that I don't know if we could get into in the podcast. Um, that's the other thing that's tricky is like, I have all of this. I I'm the one making the secrets yeah. for Cole. So I don't know what we're allowed to talk about and what we're not allowed to talk about. Um, well, I, uh, what we've done in the, in the previous podcasts was we just said, uh, Will Seltzer, would probably be a big fan of what we're doing. Yeah. If we left it outside for a, hand, a couple of years and made it really rusty. So yeah. he had a restoration project right. to make a YouTube video out of. Yeah. He would he love would what we're drive across the country a couple times to just to, to fix to one, fix, to let alone, out. let alone to buy one. Yeah. 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 So, 
Um, Will Seltzer, we fully intend on putting 10,000 more miles on the, what is, is, what is his, what is his last name? Steltzer, Seltzer, Smelzer. I don't, I don't know. I just <laughs> hope it's close when I say it. It's like Steve too. It's like Steve is like Schweitzer, Switzer, Schwimmer. Like that. You just say something that sure. sounds close and hope yeah. nobody corrects you. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah. I that's mean, fair. so, uh, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not sharing a ton of what's coming out, but, uh, I, I kind of want to, I think if you're in the know, like if you're a pot, a, a, a consistent podcast subscriber, should they get the, the insider look into what we're working on? Or I should, don't, I don't or know what not? you mean by that. I don't know. I mean, the, the rumors are already, uh, we're talking about it too much at this point, but the rumors are already out there. Well, there's a few rumors out there and one of them became a plan because there were so many rumors. Also because of Steve. Also because of Steve. Because Steve. Steve literally wished a product into potential production. Yeah. Steve would just yeah. told enough people that we should do it, that they believed that we're, we were already we're, working. We were already it. doing yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, uh, probably what would you say? Five or six people that don't work for us, but work for us. Sure. And they create more work for us than anybody oh, absolutely. or any customer absolutely. that we have. Yep. Um, which I mean, I guess we can take a little bit of time to go down that rabbit hole. Um, we made a, a custom 50 ton for Steve. Yes. Um, did so I, I, that was roughly before I was here. I don't know. Yeah. But did we go after Steve? Did Steve go after us? Cause you were kind of part of that in, in the design yeah. at the end, right? Right. So basically I, when I got at coal, mm -hmm. got to coal September of 21, Steve's frame was done. Mm -hmm. That's it. We hadn't even received the cylinder yet. So I was here for the latter half of us building Steve's press. So from my understanding, Steve went to Nathan at a blade show and said, I want a 50 ton. I want it to be a C frame. Yeah. And Nathan in his wonderful audacity for selling things before they exist. What a wonderful way to put it. Uh, said, absolutely. We can do that. And uh, it took us, I think, I think it took, at least 13 months from start to finish to get him his done. Excuse me. Um, the, so I, I was a part of the, the, the latter half of that. And so I didn't have as much design work on that per se, but I helped physically build it. And then obviously like we put the controller on it and that kind of stuff. Um, there is a press that is bigger than Steve's. True. Which is another 50 ton. But so Steve's 50 has a 12 inch travel. Mm -hmm. There is a 50 ton C frame that we did with a 16, a 16 inch travel. That one I had almost complete design, like authority over. And I wired the plug. So who you really did. contributed? You more? did. Yeah. No. Ooh. So that was, that was taking Steve's, <laughs> the design for Steve's press. Basically when I got here and I looked over everything with Steve's press, it was like, I was, you know, that was one of the things that why it made so much sense to bring me on to coal is with my engineering background. Like it's no longer like, yeah, this should hold. It's like, Hey, here's the simulation yeah. as to where this press frame will fail. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the different levels that, um, you get when you actually start to do the math and stuff like that. And so I looked at Steve's press, which is totally safe. Yeah. It's totally safe, but it's could have been done better. Um, some of the material choices and that kind of stuff weren't totally optimal for what we were doing with, with his press. And so the, uh, what you see on the screen is, is, uh, Ed Claypool's 50 ton, which is just ginormous. Yeah. Um, yeah but that one was the one that I was able to go through and kind of correct some safety factors and, and get stuff squared away. So I, I was much more involved from a design perspective with Claypool's 50. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, Steve was kind of the first person. There had been other people requesting a 50 ton. Oh, there's still, yeah, there's there still, still are, are, but I think Steve was specifically like, I don't care how big it is, but it needs to be a C frame top acting mm -hmm. and it needs to be at least 50 tons. So 
Steve's kind of had that way with a couple of projects <laughs> that we're working on. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Uh, Steve has told us what to make him. Yes. Times. Yes. Um, and the once again the wonderful audacity of Steve. Sure. Because his first interaction with us was. Nathan wasn't even, not only it wasn't like, oh, we can do that. It was, Steve, we're going to do that. Yeah, well, that we will, will do this We for will you. do this. Yeah. And so he just thinks that's that's the norm. Yeah. So, you know, Steve's like, hey, you're going to make this. And we just, ah, okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Steve. Sounds good. Because he's Sounds not good. wrong. He's no. He's he's, they're all good ideas. Yeah. They're great ideas. If yeah. I have anybody coming in and telling me what we should do as far as building machinery for, um, you know, our customer base, yeah. Steve has the insight. Right. You know, and he's exactly. also very realistic. I've had conversations with him. He's like, well, you boys don't need to worry about that. Sure. I also love yeah, how we're totally. Not he's pretty we're, like down to earth. We're you boys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, right. We are, we are just children that live in his neighborhood. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Basically. But you know, he'll be, you, you boys don't need to worry about that. What you got to do is, and then it's, it's always like, yeah, go for it. And you know, you take it. Yeah. Notes, just so. hit record. Yeah. Yeah. We, we've been super blessed to have, what I would consider titans of our industry. Yeah. And you know, it's funny cause as the engineer, I'll get on phone calls with companies trying to sell us, um, like technical sales, mm -hmm. right? So they'll, we'll have a, a hydraulic supplier or a motor supplier or an automation supplier or whatever, you know, hit, hit us up and those calls get directed towards me and I can kind of vet like, Oh, is this something we could actually use? Or is this like, they don't, they didn't even look at our website before trying to sell right. something or whatever. Somebody reached out the other day and asked uh, if we could supply a Chinese corporation with coal. They wanted perfect shipping containers of coal. Good. And I responded with coal is our name. Yes. Not what we do. And right. they immediately. Thanks for the response. Yeah. You didn't All even right. look at our website. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Know? Yeah, exactly. But yeah, so I'll have, you know, these, these phone calls with like technical salesmen or sales engineers. And the thing that I have to lead with is like, Hey, so we are a hydraulic press manufacturer. We build 25 ton presses, mm -hmm. not 25,000 ton presses, right. you know? So Nathan and I actually went to a forging industry trade show up in Detroit, uh, a year and a half ago or whatever. Yeah. And we walked in and we're like, and this, to be fair, like there wasn't a, this was the, when that, that show, when it's in Detroit, it's just like all the booths with the pamphlets. When mm -hmm. you go to it, when it's in Cincinnati, they actually have the like machines giant and drop hammers yes. and presses and stuff to demo what's going on. Uh, so it was like kind of lame that we went to the other one, but we, you know, we walked into this, sh this show and we're interacting with these people and having to clarify like, Oh no, like our presses run on a dryer plug. Yeah. You know, like single phase power in a residential garage. Yeah, we do, we do one ten in this family. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Our most popular product you could run in your kitchen. Yeah. Like, it, it, it's just two completely different worlds, but you know, so for me to say Titan of industry, the industry being very like grassroots, homegrown DIY weekend warrior, you know, it's, it's guys who are making a living oftentimes with our machines, but mm -hmm. you, we've had the blessing to be able to, and the privilege to be able to rub shoulders and make products for, and get feedback from people who have to say that they've been there and done that. 10 times over is an understatement like Steve and Ed Claypool and, you know, countless others that are s steering the whole direction of this, like, you know, maker industry. Yeah. Yeah. So they're the, they're the, uh, the, the mentorship, right? Yeah. Like every community has it, you yeah. know? So, and, and we have those guys, I don't want to say like, Oh, we have them on our side. That sounds like really cocky. I mean, it's our podcast. Stuff. We can say that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think I actually said it last time when I was talking to Nathan, the thing that always gets me, no matter what event I go to is you get these guys that come out and I've, you know, I've followed them since 2000. 11 or whatever sure. Instagram yeah, came out, right? I've, right. Yeah. I've followed you. I know your work. I've, yep. you know, I'm super pumped on every time you post and they're excited to meet us. Yeah. And it's like, you know, last, last year, not, yeah, it was last year at Blade Show. We were next to Bob Dozier. Right. And right, Bob right, Dozier right, right. kept leaning over to talk to me. Yeah. And I was like, do you, do you remember who you are? Like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and he just kept complimenting our stuff. And, yeah. and you know, he was giving slight, there was a couple things he was like, well, I wish it would be like this. And I was like, okay. Yeah. 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 Um, but it, it, we, and, and people like Steve who, who comes in and he's just stoked on what we're doing. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's always just such culture shock, I guess, to me. And I, and I hope it never stops. I hope that appreciation is always yeah, there yeah. because it's like, you literally are paying for me to buy a house, to feed myself, to sure. buy a car. And 
you want to take a picture with me? Right. You know, like we've yeah. got a, a, a school up in Northern Indiana that it, the utmost support, everything they do, they call us and tell us. Right. And they're so stoked on everything we do. Yeah. It's like, you spent money. We should be doing that. We should be right. reaching out every time you post right. on Instagram and, and, you know, reaching out to the kids that are graduating. Yeah. And it, and it seems like somehow it's been turned around and people are super stoked. I have people that email yeah. me all the time and say like, Hey, here's my knife. Here's what I made this week. Here's what, you know, right. Hey, I made this new die set. You guys well, should I mean, think about go it. Go look at our social media. Yeah. We are constantly reposting, especially in the stories of thousands of I mean, we're not posting thousands, but we are getting tagged in hundreds, if not thousands of people using our stuff every single day to make cool stuff. Yeah. You know, we're not making printers. Yeah. Or something that, you know, something run of the mill. We're not making widgets. Sure. You know, the, the machines that we're doing are actually enabling people to further their work. Right. Which you always start to get into the like, well, you know, it's, it's about the, the craftsman, not the tool. Right. Yeah. But like at the same time, the tools can be nice. I'll take <laughs> yeah. a, tw I'll take a 12 ton over a hand hammer when I'm making Damascus any day of the week. Yeah. Let alone 120 ton. Yeah. But you know, more on those later. <laughs> no, those are on the website. We That's true. That's true. They are, they are on the website. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's cool. It's, it's super cool to be involved. And the, the group of guys here is, is unbelievable. Yeah. That's where I was going to go next is, is, you know, you mentioned we don't make printers, right? We don't make washers and dryers. Sure. It's one thing to have somebody who uses their machine at home. And it's like everybody who makes a printer probably has used a printer. Everybody who's sure. making washers and dryers has a washer and dryer at home. Right. But the guys here are so stoked about what they're doing. Yeah. We have people, you know, that have quit jobs, made some sacrifices to come right. work here because it's cool. And right. once again, it's really cool feeling that support when I run a morning meeting and I know that these guys all woke up and they got to come to work. They didn't yeah. have to come to work. Yeah, for um, sure. And so it's just, I don't know, a really cool community that we've been able to build both customers with employees. Um, I don't really know where I was going with that. I just, no, I just want to make sure that it's cool part. Yeah. Part of this podcast is just us showing an immense gr gratitude yeah. to, be, to be able to do really cool stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, the stuff that I'm working on on a daily basis, it's like, I, this is my job. Yeah. Like I get healthcare when I do this. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's wild, you know, and it's, it, it circles back to, you know, talking about the customers we, we've interacted with, you know, the Titans of industry, the guys that maybe aren't as well known, but are using our products to put food on their table. And even the guys here, like it all circles back to community. Yeah. Right. And that's the thing for me that across the board, like if we were to title this podcast, this is what I would title it is like, I have never not been floored at the community involved. That's a really long podcast. Okay. Okay. Fair. I have never not been floored. I've by never that. not been floored by the community <laughs> that we have in this industry, yeah. especially coming from a lot of my background. You know, I worked in a gun store when I was in college, um, during the summers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you look at like the firearms industry and that outdoor industry, it is vicious and toxic. Yeah constantly. Yeah. And there's tons of other industries that are like that. And then you go to blade show and, or, you know, the Instagram at large or whatever platform you're on. And you look at the knife slash maker community yeah. and like what you see at the pit at blade show of just like a bunch of buddies grabbing beers and talking about the yeah. stuff that they're all mutually interested in. That is the industry as a whole. Yeah. And that community of like people supporting each other, you know, you're constantly seeing like, for example, um, Jason Knight, mm -hmm. another legend in the industry who's yeah. running one of our presses, had a shop fire a few months ago and had, you know, his son and daughter-in-law, him and his family, and they all had individual GoFundMes for like their portions of the shop and they all got fully funded mm -hmm. very quickly. And it's a running joke amongst knife makers that uh, GoFundMe is the healthcare provider <laughs> yeah. of the knife yeah. industry, right? But I mean, you take a like step back from that and look at that for what it is. And it's like, it's a community supporting yeah. each other. And, well, and it's a lot of guys that have decided like, I'm probably never going to be a millionaire. I'm probably never sure. going to have all the nicest, fanciest, most amazing things, Yeah. but I'm, I get to do something I'm passionate about. Yeah. And so it's people who actually want to be here, right? You don't go to work at McDonald's 
because you love making Big Macs. You go there because hopefully it's, it's it's safe. There's healthcare. There's sure you know and say what you you want. I've had friends that have worked in upper management at McDonald's and they make good money when sure. they get up there. You same with Walmart and stuff like that. So, but the 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 thing about blacksmithing, bladesmithing, you know, it's going to be very 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 rare that you become feasibly wealthy. Sure. So it's guys chasing passion, not yeah. wealth. And part yeah. of passion is education. It's with sharing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing for me is the education stuff. Like, for example, what got me into this whole thing in the first place was a dude willing to give me his, his sharpening his process. Yeah. yeah, what most people would consider their trade secrets. Yeah. He was had no hesitation to showing that to me because he knew that it would could only benefit me. Mm-hmm. And it didn't cost him anything like it, that level of generosity really set the tone for me Yeah, moving forward and, and how I've approached, you know, myself in the industry and that kind of stuff. It's like, gosh, it, it's just a community of people who just love on each other Yeah, and are all, you know, kind of, I, I, you know, Dave always calls it their colleagues in the craft. Yeah. Right. Which I think is actually a really clever way to put that. Um, yeah, it's just, super cool to be a part of. Yeah. I've, I've, I've yet to have an interaction ever inside of the blacksmithing community that I walk away going, wow, that guy really, that sucked. Sucked. (laughs) Right. Even there, there, you know, there, there might be some interactions where I'm like, Oh, that was a little weird. Cause sure. I have a very certain type of personality and you no, yeah, Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, everybody's my best friend and uh, some people don't respond to that well. So I can understand where that's off putting, especially in a community where people tend to spend a lot of time alone and coming out to something like sofa. And I'm just Mm -hmm. like in your face immediately. Yeah. Um, I understand why that's weird and offsetting. So I've never walked away from a scenario like that being like, what a jerk, what an old curmudgeon. Like, right. Even in those scenarios, I, I walk away and I'm like, Oh man, next time I talk to him, I got to do better. Sure. You know? yeah. Like there's a, I think his name's Jeff. Um, Jeff worked at a bunch of different uh, um, plants and he's really, really knowledgeable in hydraulics. Mm-hmm. Um, and he comes out and he, I mean, he goes into safety for our floor. He, he knows literally everything. I'm, yeah. I, I think he's a, a government plant. Right. I, like he knows everything. Sure. Um, he's an amazing dude. I feel like I, like I have the worst interactions with him because I just want so much knowledge. Sure. Every time he yeah. talks, I'm just like, keep going, keep going, keep going. And he's like, man, I'm dude, retired. Dude, I'm, chill. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been retired. Like, please, I'm not on that kind of time yeah. frame. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's just like this, this entire community and, and every interaction I get to have yeah. is supportive. Totally. And even when we get people that call us and they're like this broke, it's never like you piece of trash. I can't, it's like, Hey man, yeah. This this broke. How can you how can you fix it? Right. Okay, here's how we fix it. And then they're like, I love this. This and and it's like a 30 minute follow up to the 5 minute. Fix, yeah, right. You know? Right. Yeah. No, it's 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 pretty awesome. I think uh we're poised to do a lot of good. Yeah. Not only in the products that we offer, but also like, you know, with what we want to do with the school. Yeah. That kind of stuff. We've I mean, we've had one public class so far. We had the the launch event the, the hammer in and then one class so far, a couple more coming up, but like we haven't even really gotten a chance to like do what we want to do with the school yet. Yeah. We're doing like exercises. These are practice. Yeah. 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 It's, we we called the hammer in a soft launch Mm -hmm. and it's kind of like this whole first year of the school is the soft launch. Yeah. So you know, furthering the education stuff, offering, you know, we've, we've talked about getting the school ABS certified. So if people wanted to come do like an intro to bladesmithing course or whatever, like doing that kind of stuff, expanding that aspect of things, even the content that we're putting out online, sharing more stuff there. That's more educational for beginners and that kind of stuff, putting together some curriculums Mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, just across the board, like reinvesting in the community, excuse me, is never a bad thing. So, yeah. So, all right, so we've we've talked about kind of your origins with not only with Cole but within blacksmithing. Stop blade, hitting the table, blacksmithing. You have hit the table so many times. Have while I? You're talking. Have I really? It is a hundred percent you. That is like the second time I've done. I'm it. I'm sorry. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna like <laughs> tie my hands behind my back next time. Hands. Yeah. Uh, so we've talked about what got you here. 
uh, both within the community with coal itself. We've talked sure. about what your contributions are. Uh, what do you have Northwest blade works, which is your knives that we've talked Indeed. about a little bit that you sell. Yes. What do you have coming up with, with Northwest? How can people get involved? Not with coal, but with sure. Lark? Sure. Yeah. That's, that's interesting. So Northwest blade works is just my brand for my personal work. Um, it's kind of fluctuated between, you know, as seasons of life come and go, either I'm producing a lot of knives or I'll go through six months of not getting a chance to make anything or whatever. But, uh, I just moved my shop to my house, uh, at the beginning of this year. That was something that was huge for me when I moved to Indiana was like, I don't have anywhere to set up shop. And thankfully Cole had space for me to do that here, which was a huge blessing. Um, but being able to move that to the house has been awesome to be able to just like have it kind of separated. But, um, yeah, so I'm still producing work uh, on my own time, trying to ramp that stuff up. Um, wanting to get into some more production stuff as well. Um, you know, one of the things that I've have been able to learn here at, at coal is get more into the CNC side of things and start to work on some process development with that for me personally, mm -hmm. um, in, in doing some production level blades, at least in quantity, um, and then still doing folders and that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I, you know, as long as I'm here at coal, I don't know really what shape Northwest blade works is going to take moving forward. It's not going to go away by any means. I'm trying to to let that be, you know, something that's continuing to grow and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I'll, you know, in my off time, I'm, like currently I'm working through a batch of pre-orders that I took uh, a couple of weeks ago and um, I do drops at least. I try to do one at least once a month where I'll, you know, whatever I have finished at the time is usually five or six blades uh, a month. I'll throw on my website and, and uh, make available. Um, and then, yeah, I'm going to get this summer more into Damascus and stuff. Once my hammer gets here, which is something that I haven't talked a whole lot about on social media or anything, but really stoked to get a old world 1928 nasal 2B power hammer here at the shop. It's going to be a ton of fun to play with. Literally. L literally. A ton. Well, yeah, it's actually about five tons of yeah. fun to play with yeah. all said and done, but, um, yeah, getting, you know, more into some Damascus stuff, but yeah, uh, in terms of getting involved, um, you know, my Instagram is at Northwest blade works all spelled out. Okay. Um, check me out there. That's where I'm the most active for sure. I do have a Facebook group, uh, that's got maybe 200 members or something like that. That's still growing. I'm really bad about keeping up with that and posting there, but that's more of a, Again, a kind community. of exactly yeah. trying to foster that community and, and, um, whether it's someone wanting to like resell a blade that they don't need anymore, or, you know, just wanting to be involved in interacting with other, um, owners and stuff of a community, like you said, makers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's that on Facebook. And then, you know, I have the website. Um, the best way to stay up to date is the newsletter on the website because that's not subject to social media algorithms. Thank sure. God. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of the gist of it. I, uh, I need to update my website and get more recent work on there. If you want to see more, the most up to date, uh, examples of my work would be Instagram for okay. sure. But yeah. Cool. That's kind of, well, it. do you have anything else to pitch before we get out of here? Uh, I would, but we'd probably have to, to cut it out because it's all trade secrets. So we just explicitly said there's no such thing as trade. Secrets. That's and that's true. D the generosity of the knowledge and that kind of stuff. All right. Well, <laughs> that's all you got. That's all I got. That's all I got. That's all right, all guys. I got. Thank you for spending uh, about an hour and 15 minutes with us. We'll catch you on the next one. I like don't want to take the headphones off. Sitting on my off. wallet this entire time and my butt hurts so bad. How do you think that went?